good morning. If you've got a Bible, and I hope you do, open with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15 is where we're going to be. Uh, let me just echo what Steve was saying. If by any means you are up now early next week, uh, please come on in at 845. Listen, one of the hardest things in the world to do is to uh, wake up and there be fire in your bones. You're ready to preach and you come to church and there's like 10 people in the 845 service, all right? Don't do that to Dustin. That's a hard, that's a, and man, it, it, don't do that to those 10 people, right? That next week, that Dustin's just going to lay it on those 10 people, man. They're going to be saved and they're just already going to get, so you need to be here, okay? Uh, make sure that uh, if, if you make plans to be here or either serve in another service. Uh, listen, God is just doing uh, a mighty work uh, in our church and, and we don't want to uh, be found uh, unfaithful with all that God is sending and doing. So uh, be sure to do that. And let me just say, I can remember even when this service, when I showed up at this service and it would if there were 15 or 20 people in here right we had had a good service and I'm, I'm just thankful at everything God's doing and how God is is blessing upstate church five force and it the spirit here is just tangible so let's not let's not take that for granted uh, as we start this morning you should be finding your way to John chapter 15 and I'm going to pray for us as we begin pray with me God I'm so thankful this morning that we have the opportunity to uh, know you, dear God, to, to fall in love with you, God. I pray today that you would just do what only you can do in this place. Help us know what it means to follow you, dear God. Help us know what it means uh, to live as a Christian, dear God, and to, to lay aside other things that might hold us back in order to, to know you more, Lord. We love you and we praise you. Let it be done in your name. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, it, it, we are now two weeks into resolution season, okay? I hope that you find yourself uh, still committed in your resolutions, okay? Sometimes starting a new resolution is, is hard. I heard one person outside, I'm not going to tell you their name because you, you, you know them, all right? But they had asked, somebody asked them, how's your resolution going? Have you been to the gym this week? And they said, no, I haven't been one day, right? Why is that? Resolutions are hard right? Making a change is hard. I, I've had to listen to Dustin complain at the office for the last two weeks because his arms hurt because he started working out again, right? Resolutions are hard, so I hope that you uh, are still committed two weeks into yours, but for just a moment, I want to talk to you about the place of resolutions in the Christian life, okay? Because Christians, we make resolutions a little bit differently than the rest of the world, uh, to give you an example of what I'm talking about, let me give you an example of Jonathan Edwards for just a moment. If you don't know who Jonathan Edwards is, Jonathan Edwards lived uh, from, uh, in the 1700s. He died uh, young in 1750. Uh, he was only uh, 54 when he died. But Jonathan Edwards is probably the greatest theological mind that America has ever produced. And, and he had a number of rev resolutions in his life that kind of illustrate why we as Christians should consider resolutions. Listen to what one biographer said about Edwards as he made his resolutions. He said, he was a young man unsure of his future. He had many gifts and not a few options before him. His father and grandfather were ministers, as were his uncles and others in the family tree. He had a first-rate education, one of the finest of the day, so he was well prepared for a future in the halls of academy, should he so choose. He had a penchant for science and perhaps could have headed off in that direction. But for the time being, he was a pastor, a young one at that. 18 going on 19, he found himself far from his native soil of the Connecticut River Valley and the throes of a church split in the Presbyterian Church in New York City. He had been invited to pastor the minority faction somewhere along the docks in the city's harbor. New York City wasn't nearly as busy in 1722, the year in question, as it is now. The population hovered around just under 10,000. However, for a young man from the idyllic setting of a small town in New England, it was a place unlike any he had ever seen. Amidst all of the uncertainty and flux, this young man, Jonathan Edwards, needed a place to stand and a compass for some direction. So he took to writing. He kept a diary, and he penned some guidelines, which he came to call his resolutions. 
These resolutions would supply both the place for him to stand and a compass to guide him as he made his way. You see, Christians make resolutions a little differently than the rest of the world. They aren't just about a quick fix concerning fitness or finances or some other form of self-improvement. As Christians, we make resolutions to serve as anchors in our life so that when we begin to drift as we go in the world, we have something that anchors us, that reminds us reminds us that no, this is the way that we live our life. And Jonathan Edwards, his most famous resolution, uh, it goes a little something like this, resolved to live for Christ, and even if no one else should, I shall do so alone. You see, that's an anchor, that even though you drift in the world, you have something to hold on to. Christians, we need to make some resolutions like that. And today, as we start out a new year, what I want to do is I want to offer to you a challenge to make a resolution that, ca- that can anchor your life as you move forward in the year. I want to challenge you to make a resolution to live resolved to walk with Jesus. To live resolved walking with Jesus. Today, here's what we're going to see from John chapter 15. If you're a note taker, you can write this down. True Christians are called to live connected to Jesus, consciously walking with him, and bearing fruit. True Christians are called to live connected to Jesus, consciously walking with him, and bearing fruit. Before we read John 15, let me give you a little context for what's happening. John 15 is the farewell discourse of Jesus. He, at this point, is making his way to the cross. And as he makes his way to the cross, he wants to give his disciples a final reminder about what it looks like to live connected to Jesus, about what it looks like to live as a Christian. So what he does is he gives an illustration. The Hebrew word for what Jesus does is he gives a mashal. It's In other words, it's a vehicle that transports an idea. And he wants to transport to us this idea of what it means to be a Christian. Read with me John 15, verse 1, to see Jesus' figurative uh, speech here, what it means to be a Christian. Here's what he says. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in me. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now listen, I just want you to hear these last words one more time. Because some of you have walked in here today and you've got life figured out. You're self-sufficient. Everything's going like like it should be. You've got everything together. And I want you to hear Jesus' words to you. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Listen, Jesus is giving his disciples a final reminder about what it means to be a Christian before he goes to the cross. Subsequently, Jesus is giving us a final reminder about what it means to be a Christian. And to do this, he he gives an illustration here of, of being a Christian means to be connected to Jesus. Jesus is the vine. You are the branches. If you are going to be a Christian, you must be connected to Jesus. And then Jesus spells out for us how we can live and be connected to him, how we can live and walk with him. He gives us a few things I want you to notice. The first thing I want you to see is this. Connecting to Jesus is more than a moment. Connecting to Jesus is more than a moment. 
As Christ begins to inform the disciples, uh, to remind the disciples on what it means to be a Christian, he gives them an insight into the nature of what it means to be a Christian. And he says, listen, guys, you have to remember that to be a Christian, to connect with Jesus, is more than a moment. When Christ reminds the disciples of what it means to be a Christian, I think it's important that you see this, Christ does not give the disciples a checklist. He doesn't say, well, guys, I'm on the way to the cross. Here are the five things that you must do if you are going to be a Christian. No. Instead, he calls for them to stay close. He says, if you want to be a Christian, you must stay close to me. The word Jesus uses is, you must abide in me. This word abide, it, means, it literally means hold on to, to remain in. It, it, it almost has the idea of, uh, of staying right next to. The, the best way for me to illustrate is, is, have you ever been in this Target on Woodruff Road? Anybody know? You're as crazy as the next person if you go in there. I told, listen, this is not a joke. I don't go in there anymore. I went in there one time. I told my wife I'm not going in there anymore. Those people are crazy in there. I don't know what it is. The aisles, the aisles, they're, they're like this, right? They're super small, and everybody in Greenville, that's where they shop. It's, it's a madhouse in there. And anytime I go in a place like this, I, I've developed a system. I've got a, I've got a six-year-old. It took us six years to develop the system. But I tell her when we go in places like this Target, it's like, you have got to stay close to me. If you don't stay close to me, somebody can, somebody can get you. I might lose you. You've got to stay close. The only place that's safe for you in this Target, because there's a bunch of psychopaths in here, all right? The only place that's, that's safe for you is if you are next to me. And so I, over the past six years, when we go in places like this, we've developed a system. When she gets too far and it's just me and her and we're in a hurry, what I'll do is I'll hit the back of my leg. And that sound is a reminder for her. You're not safe. Right? Some of y'all, that kind of sounds like a dog. Well, you do what you got to do, all right? <laughs> and so when I, hit, when I hit the back of my leg, she knows that she's got to catch up. And a lot of times what ends up happening is in the next moment after I hit my leg, I feel her hand touch my shirt. Or if she's not paying attention, she just runs dead into my back as I've stopped, right? But that's what Jesus is getting at. In order to be a Christian, what you need to do is stay close. You have to be connected to Jesus. Now, the reason why this is important is that Jesus is not describing an activity. Jesus is describing a state of being. He's not describing behaviors. He's describing a relationship status. To be a Christian means that you have a relationship. You are connected to Jesus. The best way I know to illustrate is this. What primarily makes me a husband is not the fact that I do husbandly activities. Right? What makes me a husband is not that I change the oil in my car or change the oil in my wife's car. What makes me a husband is not that I wash the dishes after dinner. What makes me a husband is not that I'm the one that changes the air filters. Now, listen, men, we know that we're the ones who do those things, but that's not what makes me a husband. Those are activities. What makes me a husband is my relationship status with my wife, such that what primarily makes me a husband is that more than any other person in my wife's life, I'm the one that's connected to her, such that I, when I get off work every night, I go to her house, right? When she wakes up in the morning, I am in her bed. When she's trying to get ready for work in the morning, I am in her bathroom. Right? Why are you saying it that way, Dallas? Man, we know how this is, right? I got like a three foot by three foot section in my master closet that's mine, right? The rest of it's hers. But what I'm describing to you is a relationship status. What makes me my, the husband of my wife is that I am connected to her in a way that no one else is. And Jesus is calling his disciples to say, if you want to be a Christian, what you have to do is stay connected to me. This is important for us because, listen, there are times when we consider what it means to be a Christian and we begin to, sit or, to consider what it means to be a Christian based on our activities such that we associate being a Christian with Bible reading. We associate being a Christian with prayer. We associate being a Christian with tithing or feeding the homeless. And I just want to be clear, I am pro all of those things, right? I'm not telling you to, to not do any of those things. But what I am telling you to do is that none of those things make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is that you have a relationship with Christ. You know, I think Jesus, 
in this illustration is explaining to us how we can abide. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. That means in order to be a Christian, we have to live connected to Jesus. So I think here's what Jesus seems to be getting at. To be a Christian means that we have to live consciously holding on to and connected to Jesus. Let me ask you a question. This is a question we've actually been tossing around my house since the first of the year as we talk with my six-year-old and tell her what it means to be a Christian. This is a question that me and my wife have, have been thinking through uh, personally. How often do you live consciously thinking about Jesus? Consciously live saying, I need to be connected to Jesus. You see, this isn't some subconscious activity, guys. If we are connected to Jesus, it means we are consciously walking with him. Consciously choosing to soak in his word. Consciously choosing to obey him. 15.7 says this. It says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. What does that mean? It means we live consciously soaking in what Jesus says. That the words of Jesus are what guide our life. The words of Jesus are what direct our life. Such that we come to the Bible and we read it. Not because we want to check a box. But because we want to abide in Jesus. It, we, to abide in Jesus. To live consciously holding on to him. Means we decide to consciously obey him. Look at 15. 15, verse 10, if you commit, keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. It means we decide, Jesus, I'm going to consciously obey you. What is Jesus describing here? Jesus is describing a lifestyle of living connected to Jesus. You see, what I, what I want to know is not have you ever had a moment where you just walked an aisle, said a prayer, gave your heart to Jesus. What I want to know is do you have a lifestyle of living connected to Jesus? That's what it means to be a Christian. It's more than a moment. Living to Je connecting to Jesus is more than a moment. The second thing I want you to see is this. Connecting to Jesus requires pruning. Remember, Jesus is saying, you are the vine, I am the branches. Now, the disciples, when they heard this, they would have immediately understood what Jesus was talking about because they lived in an agricultural atmosphere, an agricultural time, right? Everyone knew what it meant uh, for a vine and branches and for pruning. In 15 verse 2, Jesus says this, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch in, that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. The disciples would have heard this and understood it because they understood, understood viticultural practices. They understood how grapes grew on vines. And see, let me just explain that to you a little bit. This pruning that Jesus is talking about, when a, when a farmer was growing grapes or growing something on the vine, there were two times during the year that they would come and they would make prunings on the, on the vine. The first time in the spring, what they would do is they would come and they would take the vines that were healthy, and they would take the ones that were ripe, and they would hold them, they would pick them up and, and stabilize them on the rest of the branch because the fruit would weigh them down if not. And then once they did that, they would take these branches and they would prune the ends off of it to prepare the, the branch to produce the maximum amount of fruit. You see, what Jesus is telling his disciples and what subsequently Jesus is telling us that if you are going to be a Christian, if you are going to live connected to Jesus, that there are going to be times in your life where Jesus is going to come into your life and he is going to remove what does not belong and put in what does belong so that you can bear the most fruit possible for his kingdom. Now, I, I, I want to take some time to explain a little bit, about, a little bit of this because I, I think so many of us hear that we should bear fruit for Jesus' kingdom, and this is a foreign notion. And quite honestly, it's a foreign notion because none of us have ever uh, have, have done this. We've never had lives that bear fruit for Jesus' kingdom. And I think the primary reason is, is that a lot of us are more concerned with bearing fruit for our kingdom than bearing fruit for Jesus' kingdom. And Jesus does not come to prune us so that we can bear more fruit for us. Jesus comes to prune us so that we can bear more fruit for him. And I, we have to understand that when God begins to work in our life, it's not always going to be comfortable or feel good. This pruning oftentimes feels like discipline. 
it oftentimes feels like the hand of a father coming down onto the child to say, no, not this, try this instead. Read Hebrews with Hebrews. 12, 4 through 11 with me. This will be on the screen. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your own blood. And you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as my sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one that he loves. In other words, there are going to be times in your life where God comes and disciplines and prunes He removes what does not belong and puts in what does belong. And parents, we understand this, do we not? There are times in my children's life where I have to remove from them what they think is best because I want something better. So at the first of the year, one thing we committed to was to help our six-year-old eat less sugar. Now, why is that? Is it because I'm mean and I hate my six-year-old and I want her to have the most miserable existence ever Monday through Saturday when we don't eat sugar? If you ask her, she would say yes. That is exactly why. But no, I know that there's a better way. Doctors, we, doctors in the room, we know how this works, right? There are times when something grows in the body that it, that it does not belong. And in order for the person to have the most full life possible, what do we have to do? We have to go and remove it. But this is for your good, not for your bad. That was my little girl who just said, Dad, that was awesome, wasn't it? This is, this is good, This is why Jesus says in John chapter 15, verse 11, look at what he says. He says this. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. What's Jesus doing? He's putting out, he's pulling out what doesn't belong and he's putting in what does so that you can have the most joy-filled life possible. Can I tell you, there are sometimes, there, there are sometimes, and there may be even somebody in the room where we begrudge what God's doing and God's doing it for our good. The most painful things in your life may be the things that lead you to having the most joy in your life. Let me ask you this. What's in your life this morning, Christian, that is preventing you from living the most joy-filled life with Jesus possible? What is it? And listen, it can be good or bad. It doesn't have to just be sin. There's sometimes where good things have to go. These farmers, they would, they would sometimes come and cut these vines. They would cut the good vines, not because it was a bad vine, but because they just wanted it to produce more. What's in your life that needs to be taken so that you can bear more fruit for Jesus? The final thing we need to see here is that connecting to Jesus leads to fruit. Ultimately, every time connecting to Jesus leads to bearing fruit. Jesus is saying, listen, here's what it means to be my disciple, guys, that you need to stay connected to me and that I'm going to work in your life to pull out what doesn't belong and put in what does. And I want you to understand that if you are my disciple, ultimately you will live a life that bears fruit. Notice John chapter 15, verse 5, the certainty of fruit. He says this in John 15, 5. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. In other words, if you abide, you will produce fruit. There is no category for a Christian who abides in Jesus but does not produce fruit. In other words, there is no category for someone to call themselves a Christian but never begin to live like a Christian. As a matter of fact, there's a category for what happens to those kind of people. John 15, verse 2. Though, he says this, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, what does he do? He takes away. And the disciples would have heard this and they would have instantly understood what Jesus is talking about because not only was there the spring pruning that the farmer did when he was growing on the vine, the fall pruning, he would come and every, fru- every branch that did not bear fruit that spring, do you know what he did? He cut it and he threw it away. And here's what Jesus is saying to us, that there is not a category of Christian who does not produce fruit in this life. Now, that's a pretty big statement. So here's what we need to understand. We need to understand what is fruit. 
I'm saying that you, if you're going to be a Christian, you're, you should produce fruit. And if you're not producing fruit, you're not a Christian. So you need to understand, what is fruit? Galatians 5, 22 through 24, tell us what fruit is. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Here's what fruit is. Fruit is the overflow of living next to Jesus. Fruit is the inside person changing so that you begin to love what Jesus loves and begin to hate what Jesus hates. Fruit is doing what Jesus says when Jesus says it. Fruit is living for Christ and not for you, which is why Paul says it this way. Those who live by the Spirit have crucified the flesh. Life is no longer about you. Fruit is ultimately this, that our lives are about loving Jesus and loving what Jesus loves. And this is where it gets intensely personal for each person in the room. Fruit is not just what things look like on the outside. We're not talking about superficial appearances here. We're talking about who you are on the inside. Fruit is a descriptor of the overflow of your life. It's who you are, not just what you look like. Because listen, there was a person in this group of disciples who looked like he had fruit in his life. And his name was Judas. Judas. And the appearances looked, those superficial appearances said, this guy is someone who is connected to Jesus. He was a branch that was ultimately thrown away and thrown into the fire. And so we see the application here, do we not? So often when we think about what it means to be a Christian, we think about that we're Christians by political affiliation. I vote the right way, so I am a Christian. We think we're Christians by geography. I live in South Carolina, so I am a Christian. We think we're Christians by family heritage. My family has always been Christians, so I'm a Christian. And what Jesus is saying is that if you are not connected to me and you are not bearing fruit, you are not a Christian. Do you have fruit? Is the overflow of your connection to Jesus that you love what Jesus loves and hate what Jesus hates? Is the overflow of your connection to Jesus that you want to live connected to Jesus? Let me be clear here. My hope is not to make you doubt your salvation this morning. Because hear me say this, you don't have to bear a lot of fruit, right? In order to be a Christian, you don't have to just bear copious, and it's just obvious, but there has to be some fruit. And I don't want you to leave here today doubting your salvation if you're a Christian, but here's, I also don't want you to fool yourself into hell. If you're not bearing fruit, you are not a Christian. So as we close today, we, we all should consider what our next step should be. First of all, let me just say this. Maybe you're here today and you're realizing that you just only have a superficial connection to Jesus. Things look good on the outside, but there is no fruit on the inside. What should you do this morning? Let me just tell you, the answer to this question is so simple. Jesus said, if you want to be a Christian, abide, run, remain. And so it's just like me with my child in Target. What do you need to do? All you need to do is run to him. And listen, I would just challenge you this morning, if you are not connected, hit him square in the back. You're running so hard to him. Because if you want to be a Christian, you can be connected to Jesus this morning. All you have to do is ask and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Connect me to the vine. I want to bear fruit. I want to be a new person. Would you forgive me? Thank you for what you did on the cross. Run to him. Maybe you're here this morning and you are a Christian. Here's essentially the, the whole point of the message. If you are a Christian, true Christians are called to live consciously walking with Jesus and bearing fruit. In the new year, could I challenge you to resolve to live what Jonathan Edwards said he was going to live? Resolved to live for Jesus. And if no one else will, I shall do so alone. Would you pray with me? Lord, I just pray 
Over the next few moments, dear God, I pray a spirit of grace would just come into this place. Because, dear Lord, what I don't want to happen today is for someone to be a Christian but to doubt their salvation because they don't feel like they produce enough fruit. Dear God, I just pray that you would move our, our overthinking minds out of this. And I pray that we'd be able to ask one question. That question is simply this. Do I love Jesus? Am I connected to Jesus? Is the fruit of my life that I want to spend time and be with and, and fall in love with Jesus? And dear God, if that fruit's there, let us be, be rest in confidence that we are connected to you. But Lord, if there's anyone in this room who's not connected to you, dear God, I pray that today would be the day they run to you, Father. Run to you, remain with you, abide in you. Let them call out to you today, dear Lord. I'd love to pray with that person. Lord, we're thankful that we can be resolved to live with you and pursue you. It's in Jesus' name I pray.